Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about the common emitter amplifier by building and testing out such a circuit. As usual, I will be using the circuit that was calculated and simulated last time just to see how well the simulation matches up with real life. So if you're curious, then keep watching. Now, there are a few things to check with the circuit. We will be going through the tests one by one, and among other things, focus on the impact of the emitter capacitor. So, we just need to confirm its impact on gain, but also to check its influence on distortion and input impedance. So, first things first, let's look over the circuit schematic. Now, before going into that, I'm using the same PCB as before, and only assembling the relevant components. So that's why there's so many unplaced elements. So for this specific assembly, I'm using an output and an input SMA connector, and then the signal is AC coupled through a set of 22 microfarad capacitors. For the circuit itself, I'm using the base biasing network that we've used in the simulation. And then in the transistor emitter, I have the 100 ohm resistor. And for the capacitor, I'm using a connector so that this capacitor can be inserted or removed. And finally, in the collector, I have a 510 ohm resistor. And to finish off the board, I have a supply connector with a set of decoupling capacitors. So, looking at the finished board, we can more clearly see the holder into which the emitter capacitor will be inserted. I will be placing or removing this capacitor based on the specific test that we are carrying out. And, as always, the central component, the amplifying element, is the BC547C transistor. First thing to check, of course, is the DC operating point. Now, this may seem like a trivial test, but especially if you're designing the circuit yourself, there's always a possibility of making some sort of mistake with the calculations. And even if those are correct, then if the board is hand assembled like this one, especially if you're using SMD components, there's always a big chance of putting in the wrong component. So to test the circuit, I prepared the power supply, set to 10 volts, and if we turn on the supply, we can measure the various voltages in the circuit. So for that I have a voltmeter. First thing we can look at is the voltage present on the emitter resistor, which is about 1.05 volts, which is very close to the 1 volt that we were supposed to get. And knowing that the resistor value is 100 ohms, the current running through this resistor, so the emitter current, is 10.5 milliamps, so very close to the 10 milliamps that we were aiming for. Next, if we look at the collector emitter voltage, we get 3.64 volts, so again, very close to the value that we had in the simulation. And finally, the voltage drop on the collector resistance is 5.38. So all three of the DC values in the circuit are running as expected. So far, so good. Next, we can look at signal amplification. For this test, I changed the setup a bit, so my amplifier gets its signal from the signal generator, and I'm passing it through a 5 kilo ohm impedance. Reason for this is so that we can measure the signal on the generator side, but also on the amplifier side. So depending on the test that we want to carry out. For this test, we are measuring on the amplifier side, so using the first channel of the oscilloscope. Then, on the amplifier output, I have a 510 ohm load, and here is where the second channel of the oscilloscope is connected. So first test to do is confirm that the amplifier is actually amplifying. For that I will be using a 1 kHz sine wave, which at the amplifier input is about 30 mV peak to peak. Now if we also connect the second channel of the oscilloscope, so both channels are running at 10 mV per division, we can clearly see that the amplifier is indeed amplifying, not by a lot though, so the output peak-to-peak -peak amplitude is about 68 millivolts, so the gain is about 2 point something. This is of course without the capacitor placed, and at the same time, we can also observe that the input signal and output signal are 180 degrees phase shifted, so the output is inverted in reference to the input. Next we can connect a 470 microfarad capacitor, in parallel with our resistor, and the first thing we can notice is that the output voltage is much much larger than before, so we need to rescale things a bit. So this time 
our input signal is about 15 millivolts peak to peak, whereas the output is 700. So we have a completely different level of gain, much, much higher than before, and the amplifier is still inverting the input signal. So adding the capacitor does improve the gain. But at what cost? To observe this, we can work with slightly larger signals. So something that will drive the amplifier into a distorting mode. So first off, the circuit without the capacitor, I set an input voltage so that the output is about 4 volts peak to peak. We can see that while the amplifier is inverting, the input and output looks like sine waves. But if we invert one of the channels, we can overlap the two and we can see that, well, at least by eye, the input and the output signal are the same. So the amplifier without the capacitor when it's outputting 4 volts peak to peak doesn't distort or not very obviously. Now, after adding in the capacitor and resizing the two waveforms, this time the input signal is much, much smaller, of course, what we can observe is that the input and output don't perfectly overlap. So both of the signals are centered around the same point, but what we can see is that the blue output signal is getting overamplified at one end and underamplified at the other in reference to the input signal. So with this waveform, the peak output voltage is actually the minimum output voltage because it's inverted. So peak collector current is occurring at this upper end. This is where the amplifier gain is maximum. And then the collector current is minimum at the lower end where the gain is minimal. So we can clearly see that with the much higher gain, thanks to the electrolytic capacitor, we are getting way more distortion for the same 4 volt peak to peak output signal. So increasing the gain is bringing a bit of problems, and when the distortion is this visible, then you really have a problem. Next, we can look at the amplifier's gain performance over a wide frequency range by performing a Bode plot analysis. For this, I will be sweeping the input signal frequency and letting the oscilloscope plot out the gain and phase ratio between amplifier input and output. And for this test, I will be going between 10 Hz and 50 MHz at the rate of 10 points per decade. And first test to perform is with the input signal measured directly at the input of the amplifier without the capacitor. So if we now let the measurement equipment do its thing, it takes a while. So eventually the first measurement is finished. We can see a relatively flat gain response. So somewhere around 7 point something decibels. We can see that this drops off at high frequency, but also there's a bit of a dent at low frequency. So this low frequency curve is caused by the coupling input and output capacitors. So these are not ideal capacitors. They're only 22 microfarads. And at some point their impedance starts to become comparable to the input output impedance. Another thing to mention is the phase, it seems to be jumping around a bit, but that's just an artifact of the measurement. So when the phase exceeds 180 degrees or goes below minus 180, then the device just makes this sort of jump. So the phase isn't jumping, it's just going around 180. And in a similar fashion perform the measurement for the circuit with the capacitor. And with the capacitor, we can see that our flat gain level is much higher around 36 decibels, we see the same curve at low frequency, so it's more obvious this time, and we can also see that at high frequency, although the gain drops, it doesn't really pass through zero, so we still get 12 decibels of gain, even at 50 megahertz. But this is when we are measuring the input signal at the input of the amplifier. Next, I will swap the probe to measure before the 5 kilo ohm impedance. So if we would have a 5 kilo ohm signal source, we would be measuring the initial signal. And that should give us a more realistic result of what this amplifier is capable of. So for this test, I move the series resistance close to the amplifier and I'm measuring before it. Now, I already made the first measurement, so the one without the capacitor. We can see the same flat response. This time it's occurring at around 4 decibels. So the initial input signal gets attenuated by the series resistance to input impedance ratio, so that's why the gain from this point looks smaller. And if we go to higher frequency, we can observe that the unity gain is somewhere around 2.5 MHz. So this is the case without the capacitor. Now if we include the electrolytic capacitor, 
and weight again. So once this measurement is also concluded, we can go through the values again. We can see a fairly flat response of about 25 decibels. And then the amplifier has its unity gain point around 6.3 MHz. So the unity gain point moved slightly higher by adding the capacitor. And there's one more thing that we can try out. So for the moment, I'm using an electrolytic capacitor by itself. But at high frequency, its impedance starts to increase because of the equivalent series inductance. So the final test to do is to use a electrolytic capacitor in parallel with a ceramic capacitor. So this is a 470 nanofarad capacitor in parallel with the same 470 microfarad capacitor. So if we run the test one more time like this, we can see a similar 25 dB flat response area and the unity gain is also at around 6.3 megahertz. So in this particular case, not much has changed by adding the lower impedance capacitor. But if the amplifier would have worked at much higher frequencies, then the change would have been a bit more noticeable. Now, one of the things that is quite variable with this sort of amplifier is the input side impedance. It's dependent on the transistor gain, but also on the emitter impedance. So variations in that will impact the input side impedance as well. Now, I did discuss the general method of how this can be measured in a previous episode, but just how hard is it to actually determine the complex value? For that, I prepared the setup in which I kept the 5 kilo ohm series resistor on the input signal and I did a probe both in front of it on the amplifier side and before it on the signal generator side. Now, there are three things we need to measure to be able to calculate the complex impedance. On the one side, we need the signal that arrives at the load, so we get that from the first channel. We need to determine the current that is pulled by the load, and we can get that by knowing the voltage difference divided by the series resistance. And finally, we need to know the phase shift between voltage and current. And we need to know all three of these values at different frequencies, which are set by the signal generator. Unfortunately, most oscilloscopes don't have a simple automated way of doing this. So you'll have to manually set the various frequencies and perform the various measurements on the oscilloscope. To aid, however, in the process, I made a few specific settings. So on the one hand, I enabled the math function, which performs the subtraction of one channel from the other, so that we get the voltage difference. Then to measure the two signals, I added the RMS measurement on the input signal and the RMS measurement on the math channel. And finally, to be able to measure the phase shift, I wasn't able to set a delay measurement between the two signals, but what I was able to set is a measurement between the moment of triggering and the next rising edge on the measured signal. So I set this measurement on both the channel 1 and the math channel. So if we quickly turn on the signal generator, I left all three signals, so the two oscilloscope probes and the math channel, and even though we don't directly need the second oscilloscope probe, it's good to see it just to make sure that it doesn't saturate or doesn't get out of the measured range. And well, this is what the results end up looking like. So we get our four values, which we will later process. Final observation to make about the measurement setup. For the acquire method to make the waveforms as clean as possible, I set an average acquisition mode with 16 averages. So not much left to do. Time to go through the various frequencies and we'll process the data a bit later on. So after setting up the measurement, I simply save the measurement and I can later process it. So first we need to measure the amplifier without the capacitor. And after going through the values, we can measure also the amplifier with the capacitor. So I summarize the various results in this spreadsheet and based on the measured values, we can get the final impedance value. So first of all, the polar form impedance can be calculated based on the ratio of the two measured voltages times the known resistor, the 5 kilo ohms. And then for the phase shift, first of all, we need to calculate the time difference between the two time measurements. And then this is being multiplied by the test frequency and 360 to get the phase shift in degrees. Finally, the polar form of impedance can be turned into a rectangular form, so something that has a real resistive part and an imaginary reactive part. For this, the measured impedance is multiplied by the cosine or sine of the phase shift, 
to get the two elements of the value. And finally, we can turn this reactance into a capacitance just to get an idea of what would be the equivalent circuit. So they have a resistor and a capacitor. So after getting all of these numbers and all of this data, what does this actually tell us? Well, I went ahead and plotted it out. So the resistive part and the reactive part, and this we can compare to the simulated results. So on the upper side, we have the measured and simulated results for the circuit without the capacitor. And then on the bottom, we have the results for the circuit with the capacitor. Now, just as a quick mention, in the simulation for the reactants, I've extracted the imaginary part of the measured input impedance, and this only gives me positive values. So for whatever reason, this never goes negative, regardless if it's a capacitive or a inductive impedance. But regardless, if we compare the two graphs, well, they're extremely similar. So both the measurement and the simulation is telling us that for the capacitorless circuit, we should have around 10 kilo ohms of resistive impedance. And then at around the frequency of 100 kilohertz to 1 megahertz, we have this reactive bump, which is very clearly visible also on the simulation. If we move to the circuit with the capacitor, again, very similar results, both on the resistive curve and on the reactive curve. But for this circuit, even though we don't really expect perfect matching between simulation and measurement, we do see that the measured impedance is quite large in reference to the simulated one. And one possible reason for this difference being that the exact capacitor that I'm using has a non-negligible ESR, which was not simulated. So I went ahead and measured the ESR of this capacitor. And if we put that into the simulation, we get a new input impedance graph, which is higher. So by taking into account the real parasitics of the capacitor, we can get a far more realistic simulation result. In general, the simulator isn't wrong. It's the models that are usually not accurate. But all in all, this measurement actually went way better than I expected. So there's very good correlation in between the two. In the end, the common emitter amplifier is a good choice when both voltage and current gain is needed, which is most of the time. But care must be taken if you want to minimize distortion. At the same time, you need to keep in mind its operational bandwidth, since this can be quite limited. Now, if only there was a way to make a better amplifier, something that combines the features of the various single transistor circuits. But that's something for another time. For now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated to all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.